it started. So I started Songs and Hymn Books and turned the page. 277, Only Trust Him. It's in the first, second, and last verse, page 277. Come every soul by sin and pray. There's mercy with the Lord, and He will surely give you rest by trusting in His Word. Only trust Him, only trust Him, only trust Him now. He will save you. Rich blessings to be stowed. Plunge now into the crimson blood that washes white as snow. Only trust Him, only trust Him, only trust Him now. He will save you, He will save you, He will save you now. Come, Come in and join this holy band, and on to glory go, to dwell in that celestial land where joys immortal flow. Only trust Him, only trust Him, only trust Him now. He will save you, He will save you, He will save you now. Now let's turn to page 310. Footprints of Jesus. It's in the first, second, and last verse. Page 310. <coughs> Sweetly, Lord, have we heard thee calling. Come, follow me. And we see where thy footprints falling. Lead us to That make the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus wherever they go. Go they lead over the old dark mountain, seeking his sheep. Or along by Salon. Mountains helping the weak. Footprints of Jesus that make the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus wherever they go. He sees us our journey done. We will rest where the steps of Jesus in at his throne. Footprints of 
Jesus that make the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus where they go. All right. Now let's turn to page 325. Trust and obey. Let's see the first, second, and last verse, page 325. When we walk with the <laughs> Lord in the light of His Word, for the glory He sheds on our way, while we do His good will, He abides with us still, and with all who will trust and Obey, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the sky. But his smile quickly drives it away. Not a doubt or a fear, not a sign or a tear, can abide while we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. In fellowship sweet, we will sit at His feet, or we'll walk by His side in the way. What He says we will do, where we sin, we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. with another beautiful day it looks like before the rain comes but uh, we thank him for it for sure um, we looked and we we left off with two different sections of scripture in um, Hosea chapter uh, 11 and uh, we ended up in looking at God's direction, His compassion, and His provision. And uh, in verses 3 and 4 of Hosea, Hosea chapter 11, it says, I taught Ephraim also to go, taking them by their arms, but they knew not that I healed them. I drew them with cords of a man with bands of love and I was to them as they that take off the yoke on their jaws, and I laid meat unto them. Verse 8 says, And how shall I give thee up, Ephraim? How shall I deliver thee, Israel? How shall I make thee as Adma? How shall I set thee as Zeboam? Mine heart is turned within me. My repentings are kindled together. 
I will not execute the fierceness of my name. I will not return to destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not man, the Holy One in the midst of thee, and I will not enter into the city. So we we look at this and as much, I believe, as God wanted to punish them and correct them and chasten them, He loved them with a love that was uh, undescribable. And we find that the very compassion of God, you know, God reveals the very power of compassion in these verses. The Lord said, How shall I give thee up, Ephraim? How shall I deliver thee, Israel? How shall I make thee as Adma? How shall I set thee as Zeboah? Mine heart is turned within me. My repentings are kindled together. That phrase, my repentings are kindled together, can also be translated as my compassions are aroused. They are stirred up. They are overflowing. This verse is a mural of the heart of God. We, uh, it reveals that His love for His people is a love that will never let them go. They are still His people no matter what. Our children, no matter how they act, what they do, or what they've done, or whatever, they're still our children. And we love them. Same as with God here. He takes... Ephraim and and Israel and and they are like his children. No matter what they've done, he still loves them. And he's not going to let them go. The Lord asked four rhetorical questions that reveal how hard it was for him to turn Israel over to an enemy for punishment. They are strong expressions of divine emotion. Specifically, love and compassion for His chosen people. Adma and Zeboam were cities of the plain that God annihilated along with Sodom and Gomorrah. He could not bring Himself to deal with the cities of Israel as He had with these towns. He would not totally destroy them. His heart of judgment was turned upside down into a heart of compassion. For we find that He says that God is God and not man. Man's first thing would be to just turn them over, punch them, whatever. But we're talking about God here. When people get angry, they are often incapable of tempering their anger with compassion. But God's emotions operate in a perfect balance. We find that when compassion grips the heart of the Christian, it will give him an intense burden for the lost and those who are hurting. Because of his compassion, In the Gospels, we find where Jesus wept over Jerusalem and the Good Samaritan, He stopped to aid a rejected victim that had been robbed and beaten on the roadside. Compassion will give you a concern for those who are wayward and wandering away from the Lord. The compassion of Jesus made Him reach out and restore Peter. Compassion will enable us to forgive those 
who have been harsh, cruel, unkind towards us. We find that Joseph's compassion caused him to yearn for his brothers. He didn't give up on his brothers, but he yearned for them. The compassion of Christ for you and I has put Him on the cross and kept Him there so that our sin debt could be paid. Compassion is the flame that keeps our hearts afire for Christ. It keeps our focus upon our purpose to serve and to glorify God and be His ambassadors to a lost and dying world. That's compassion. That same type of compassion that now we find that God has for Ephraim and for Israel. He can't, it's hard for Him to, to turn them over for punishment. From 1986 to 1990, Frank Reed was held hostage in a Lebanon cell. For months at a time, Reed was blindfolded, living in complete darkness, or chained to a wall, and kept in absolute silence. On one occasion, he was moved to another room. And although blindfolded, he could sense that there were others in the room. Yet it was three weeks before he dared peek out to discover that he was chained next to Terry Anderson and Tom Sutherland. Although he was beaten, made ill, tormented, Reed felt uh, most the lack of anyone caring. He said in an interview with Time Magazine, nothing I did mattered to anyone. I began to realize how withering it is to exist with not a single expression of caring around me. I learned one overriding fact. Caring is a powerful powerful force. If no one cares... You are truly alone. However, Christians who are never truly alone are also fortunate to receive God's gracious care through His love and His compassion and those brothers and sisters in Christ around them. This care can provide the strength we need to endure the trials that we face on the path of of our lives. The same love, care, compassion, and guidance that God showed His people in Hosea's time are available to us today. He cares about all of us. God's character is compassionate. And He wants to be compassionate with us. We see not only His compassion in these verses as He's he's dealing with these and, and it's hard to imagine God with emotions. But He's dealing with these emotions within Himself towards His children. So we find not only His compassion but His direction and His guidance. The immensity of God's love is seen in His guidance and His direction for our lives. You know, we we saw this morning that uh, all gave some and some gave all. And and we look at, at, as we looked at at John 3.16 and we saw that it was God so loved the world that He gave. He gave all for you and me. 
God still leads. And He still guides us day by day if we'll only let Him. The Bible makes this clear over and over and over and over again. What comfort we can find in these wonderful truths about His direction and guidance. Uh, Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy path. Psalm 37, verse 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and He delighteth in His way. Uh, John 16, verse 13. How be it when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. For He shall not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He shall hear, that shall He speak. And He will show you things to come. Uh, Psalm 32 and verse 8. It says, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. You know, God, even though they had turned their backs on Him, even though they had chosen to sacrifice and to worship unto idol gods, God still had a love for them. He still had a compassion for them. He still had a uh, a heart bent on providing direction and guidance. Even if they didn't want it, He still gave it to them. You know, at times, uh, with our children and things, and perhaps grandchildren, you know, we may, we may try to tell them. We may try to explain to them. We may try to, to guide them in, in one way or another. And they may not want to hear it. But we give it anyway. Because we love them. And we want the best for them. Same with God. Even, even in the times when, when we didn't want it, God gave it anyway. His provision. We see the immensity. And there's that word again. The immensity of God's love is also seen in His provision for us. God healed His people. He provided meat for them so that they could, they could survive. They did not deserve it, especially when they grumbled, mumbled, fumbled, and tumbled spiritually in their lives. They didn't deserve it. But He still did it. They were so hateful toward the Lord and unthankful for His care, yet the Lord still met their needs. Now He knows our needs. And He knows our wants. And He knows the difference between the two. Oftentimes it's us who kind of gets those things confused up. And He will supply our needs. Now the wants, well, they're a different story. Unless those wants line up into God's plan for us. But when we turn and, and we look, we have to realize that we are so blessed today by God's provision for us. We too were just like Ephraim, just like Israel. We didn't deserve it. We didn't deserve His compassion. We didn't deserve His direction or His guidance. We didn't deserve His provision. But as a loving Father, He meets our needs. And He wants us to realize that satisfaction is found truly only in one place. And that's in Him. The 
things of the world are just temporary. I mean, you know, they're not going to last forever. I mean, when was the last time that you ever bought that you bought something that lasts forever? Well, we don't know because forever ain't over yet, but still. You get the drift that I'm trying to get at here. Nothing lasts forever this side of heaven. We can turn around and we can buy a car today and ten years down the road, that thing's going to have rust on it somewhere. Engine may fail. The wheels may fall off of it. Who knows? But it's not going to last forever. Eventually, what is what is the commercials uh, almost car uh, uh, warranty commercials? You know, eventually it's going to break down. You know, and it's not going to last forever. We can we can buy a, a lawnmower or a, a, even a house. And they're not going to last forever. We look and we must realize that true satisfaction is only found in Him. He is the only thing that was the same yesterday as He is today as He will be tomorrow. And He's the only, he's the only thing that, that will last forever and always. And that's because He is the Creator of time. <laughs> time belongs to Him. Not to us. We are given a multitude of promises concerning His provision. Uh, Jeremiah 33, verse 3. He says, Call unto Me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Philippians 4, verse 19, But my God shall supply all your need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Ephesians 3, in verse 20, Now unto Him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Proverbs 28, verse 20. A faithful man shall abound with blessing, but he that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. You know, we, we, we've looked and as much as God was hating what they were doing, He loved them. It's the same. I, I believe that God loves all people, but He hates the sin that we do. Same with the children here of God in 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 Hosea. You know, he he hated what they were doing. He hated that they were worshiping, sacrificing uh, unto pagan idol gods and uh, aligning themselves up with people that they shouldn't be aligning themselves up with, and, and all of these things. Yet he still loved them. And it would it, it's we find in these verses it was it's hard for God to just turn them over, you know, just mark them off the slate, if you will. Because they were his creation. They were his people. We've seen the immensity of God's love, and it was demonstrated in not only his affection but His direction, His compassion, and His provision. And you know, His 
immensity of His love was also in the restoration. Look at verse number 10. He says, They shall walk after the Lord. He shall roar like a lion when He shall roar. Then the children shall tremble from the west. You know, there was a a beautiful... just, Just picture this in your mind. A beautiful Swiss village. And with a a beautiful church. It was so beautiful in fact that it was known as the Mountain Valley Cathedral. The church was not only beautiful to look at, but its high pillars and magnificent stained glass windows but it had the most beautiful pipe organ in the whole region. People would come from miles away, from far off lands, to hear the lovely tones of this pipe organ. But there was a problem. The columns were still there. The windows still dazzled with the sunlight. But there was an eerie silence from the church. The mountain valley no longer echoed the glorious, fine-tuned music of the pipe organ. Something had gone wrong with the organ. Musicians, Experts from around the world had tried to repair it. Every time a new person would try to fix it, the villagers were subjected to sounds of disharmony, awful penetrating noises which polluted the air. One day, a little old man appeared at the church door. He spoke with the sexton and and after a time the sexton reluctantly agreed to let the old man try his hand at repairing the organ. After all, they tried everybody else. Okay. For two days the old man worked in almost total silence. The sexton was in fact getting a bit nervous. On the third day, at high noon, the mountain valley once again was filled with glorious music. Farmers dropped their plows. Merchants closed their stores. Everybody in town stopped what they were doing and headed for the church. Even the bushes and the trees of the mountaintop seemed to respond as the glorious music echoed from ridge to ridge. After the old man finished his playing, a brave soul asked him how he could have fixed the organ. How could he restore this magnificent instrument when even the world's experts could not? The old man merely said it was an inside job. It was I who built the organ 50 years ago. I created it, and now I have restored it. This is what God is like. It is He who created the universe. And it is He who can, who will, and is in the process of restoring it. Our Lord is in the restoration business. You know, I, I, I we're trying to remodel our kitchen. Been trying to do it since. Well, I didn't want to go that far back. But it, you know, one thing has led to another, and you know, we won't go through all that. But you know, you when you do those things, and you you. 
tend to, to go in and, and you want to, to do them and you're trying the best you can to, to get it done. You know, it, it's, it's a project. It's a, a restoration. That's what our Lord is like. He is in the restoration business. He mends broken hearts and broken lives. He molds the repentant sinner into the image of the Lord Jesus. He moves us forward when we have been going backward spiritually. He has the power to rebuild what Satan or what we have broken all because He is God. The restoration of the Lord reveals that our solutions to our problems and predicaments are found in Him. When there is nowhere else to go, when there is no one to turn to, when there is no light at the end of the tunnel, when we don't know what to do, we have security and serenity in knowing that we can turn to Him. When our sinfulness has siphoned away our joy, He can restore it. Psalm 51 and verse 12, Restore unto me the joy of of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. When our sin has robbed us of blessings and brought judgment upon us, He can restore what has been ruined. Joel 2 and verse 25, And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army, which I have sent among you. Yeah, 2, verse 25. Chapter 2, verse 25. God judged His disobedient people by destroying the crops. God promised that He could restore what was destroyed. When our health has been ruined by disease, He can restore our health if it is His will. In His will. Jeremiah 30, in verse 17, it says, For I will restore health unto thee, and I will heal thee of thy wounds, saith the Lord. Luke 6, in verse 10, and looking around about upon them all, he said unto the man, Stretch forth thy hand. And he did so. And his hand was restored whole as the other. When a nation has been ruined by wickedness, God can restore the nation and the land. Second Chronicles 7 verse 14 if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. When the sinner calls upon Christ to forgive, and to cleanse him of his sins, the Lord will save and restore the soul of that person. Psalm 23, in verse 3, He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Because of the work of Christ, man's relationship with God has been restored by faith in Christ. Romans 5 and verse 10 says, For if, when we were enemies, 
we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. Much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to Himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. You know, because God is in the restoring business, He wants us to be doing the same thing. God wants us, or God wants to use us to restore broken people and broken relationships. The people of Israel and Ephraim, whether they realized it or not, they were a broken people. And they had a broken relationship with the Lord God of Israel. They, you know, they God could have, He should have just turned them over to their own selves. And we did find in previous chapters back that He stepped aside. He stepped back and and He he left them to themselves. But He never quit loving them. He never went away. He was right where they left Him. Waiting on them. Just as He is here in Hosea chapter 11 through His his immense love, His compassion, direction, provision, guidance, all these things, God is still there waiting on His children to turn around and to to be able to uh, be used by Him. In a future time, God would restore His people and they will follow Him one day. He would announce His intentions like a roaring lion. However, it would not be as a lion about to devour its prey, but as a lion leading its cubs to safety. He wasn't yelling or roaring at them to devour them, but to call them to safety. Calling them home. The metaphor of the lion's roar, it it means that, that God's call to His people would sound so clearly throughout the earth that they would come trembling or humbly from the west. When Christ returns, He will be returning as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He has already been the sacrificial lamb. The Lion is coming. Assyria is located east of Israel. It means that this reference to a regathering from the west does not refer to a return from Assyrian captivity. The return of Judah from the Babylonian captivity was from the east. We get it refers to a return from another worldwide dispersion. Presently the Jews, the Jewish people are dispersed all over the world. And this verse alludes to a still future restoration from our perspective in history. It may refer to the restoration that Antichrist will encourage according to Daniel 9 in verse 27. 
but more than likely probabilities are that it refers to the streaming of Israel back into the land following Christ's return to the earth. Now, there's a restoration that's coming. And this restoration is, is going to, to concern the Jewish people. There, there, there are many that have come to realize Jesus Christ is Lord. But there are many, 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 many more that are out there that haven't come to that conclusion. But we find in God's Word that there's a day come when they will. And they will proclaim Him as Lord. Isaiah 11, in verses 11 and 12, it says, It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set His hand again the second time to recover the remnant of His people, which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Patros and from uh, Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea in verse 12, And he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcast of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Now this is God doing this to me. We have so much to be thankful for in the fact that God just merely loves us. He is patient. Thank goodness for that. With our weaknesses and our faults. And yes, our immaturity. When, when he, he thinks and He sees and, and He realizes and He knows and that we should be somewhere other than where we are in our spiritual walk with Him. It would be so much better for Him and for us if we would just do what the Israel needs to do here in Ephraim and that's merely to grow up. As we look at the traits of immaturity, I'm sure that we, we may have found some that have characterized our life in some form or fashion. And if so, it, it, it's time that we just turn around and dry up the water behind our ear and set our head right. We need to realize that God can and He wants to do through us what He cannot do through anyone else. Do you realize that in the plan that God has concerning your life, in that plan, there is something that God can only do through you. Not, it's not something that He can do through me, He can do through somebody else, He can do through somebody else, but there's a bit and a point somewhere that is in God's plan that is unique just to us to, as an individual that He can only do through us. It may be touching a certain person. It, 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 it could be, it could be a, a numerous of things. But it's what only He can do through us. 
The spiritually mature person will realize this truth. The mature Christian believes God's promises in spite of his circumstances. See, oftentimes we'll believe or we'll say we believe in God's promises. And then when circumstances get a hold of us, it's kind of hard to, for us to, to keep grasp of His promise because our eyes and our heart and everything about us is focused on our circumstances. When in fact, we need to not be focused on our circumstances, but focused on Him. Because through if we'll stay focused on Him, He'll bring us through our circumstances. You know, the for the most part, our circumstances are only you know they're, they're only a molehill, and we make them a mountain. But to God, they're just a footstool underneath His feet. <laughs> you know, it, it's just as uh, as the. The, the storms of, of our life are nothing more than the carpet below the very feet of Jesus. The immature Christian is controlled by his circumstances in spite of God's promises. We need to claim God's promises and do great things for the Lord. You know, it, it boils down to the point that you know, that's the main thing that we need to be doing is we need to just be claiming God's promises. Not realize, oh, well, God's promises are true. Well, if we believe that His promises are true, then claim them. Claim God's promises for yourself. Claim them for your family. I mean, we look, think about the about Israel. Think about Ephraim. The the and as they were doing the things that they were doing, if they would have just kept their focus on God, you know, the life their their life that they that they're leading right now. Here in, in the book of Hosea, what may have, have been a lot different. But we thank the Lord that He is a restoring God. And that He, that he don't give up on us. You know, and he, he continues to work in and through the lives of Israel here. I mean, if He was said and done with it, He'd have said, all right. And that'd be it. But we find that he he has taken and taken and taken his his time, you know, and and gone through these things when he could have acted out in any different number of ways, 
in this, but now he's he's sitting up here and, and he's calling them and, and he's just wanting them to come back. He could have just said, Well, you know, if that's the way you want to go, see you later. And went on about his business. But even when he did leave them to themselves to try to teach them, he was still right here. He was nothing more than a prayer away for their restoration. He was, he, he was just right here. Wait. And he's still there. And 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 now it's it's like well you know I'm going to be I'm going to be like a roaring lion, but my roar is going to be calling you to safety. It's going to let you know where I am, so that's where you can come. Well, I hope that everybody has had a a uh, a good Memorial Day weekend so far. And I know it's still a holiday tomorrow and things, and I, I hope and pray that uh, you will remember uh, our fallen soldiers and things that have uh, paid the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom. Uh, like I said, and, and I, I believe it, it's true that freedom is free. It cost somebody something. And it cost a lot their lives so that we could be able to be free. So just remember that as you go through the day tomorrow and, and please be careful uh, towards the end and of the day and all those things as people try to come sliding back in to go to work on Tuesday and all that stuff because they're not going to be paying that much attention to anybody else. Uh, but let's. Uh, I do want to thank you for you again for for the card and your gift and things. It it, it truly uh, means a lot to me, and I appreciate it so much. And I, I love each and every one. And boy, you know, um, I hope I got many more years coming. You know, but then again, if if many more years was to me not being able to see the Lord, then I'd just soon go on home today so I could see Him. Yeah, we look in the, in the, in the psalm uh, that, you know, they so and so was there, and so and so was there, and so and so was there. Man, none of those people matter. None of those, uh, whether they're an old disciple or, or loved ones or anything else that are in heaven that are waiting on us, none of those folks matter. Just, just give me Jesus. Just show me Jesus. And that's what matters. So, you know, let's, uh, let's be sure and, and say a prayer for, uh, for our soldiers and those families that have lost loved ones and things. Uh, so let's pray and we can uh, be dismissed. I know it's, it's been a, a long day for everybody it, and things. And So let's, let's pray. Dear Lord, we do come thanking You, Lord, once again for Your many blessings. Lord, we, we thank You for the opportunities that You, you give us, Lord, to, to be able to to uh, start decorating and things for Vacation Bible School. And, and Lord, I, I just thank You for the hearts of people, Lord, that have set themselves uh, to, to doing it. And, and Lord, that You would just uh, bless them as well. Lord, just uh, take us, continue to uh, open our hearts to those that uh, have sacrificed their lives, Lord, so that we could be free today to, to come into Your house and to open Your Word. And, and Lord, that uh, uh, it would be done without persecution or, and uh, tribulation, Lord. Lord, just uh, uh, be with us now as we leave this place. Keep us safe in and through the remaining uh, the remainder of this uh 
holiday weekend, Lord, and uh, keep us safe as we travel about. We'll be sure to give you praise, honor, and glory, Lord, for all that you've said and done. For it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen.